All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Wildlife Wednesdays uh, here with WWF Canada uh, on your social media platform of choice. Uh, to, my name is Doug Chesson. I'm the Senior Specialist in Sustainable Marine Development here at uh, WWF Canada's Arctic team uh, based out of the nation's capital in, in Ottawa. Uh, I've been with WWF for about three and a half years now. Um, most of my work is focused on uh, fisheries sustainability in Canada's Arctic, particularly in the Eastern Arctic in Nunavut, uh, both with uh, community-based uh, commercial fisheries as well as offshore commercial fisheries for Greenland halibut. Um, you know, I've uh, been, as I say, I've been here for, for three and a half years. I grew up in a coastal community that uh, was pretty reliant on on fisheries and that's been a, a passion of mine for for you know my entire life basically at this point so um that eventually led me here to wwf and uh led me to meet our guest today uh dr nigel hussey from the university of windsor uh who's joining us today to talk to us a little bit about greenland shark and uh nigel i can see you here on the screen now and just before i turn it over to you i'll uh let all of our viewers know that uh, there is a Q&A session uh, during Wildlife Wednesday. So if you have any questions or comments uh, that you have about uh, Greenland shark that you'd like to get uh, a bit of explanation on, just throw them in the comments and we'll get a chance to take a look uh, and, and hopefully get you an answer on those here in a few minutes. And with that, Nige, I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your work and a lot about Greenland Shark. Well, thank you very much, Doug, and uh, thank you, WWF Canada, for having me here uh, today to speak to you. So uh, I'm a, a professor at the uh, University of Windsor in, uh, in the uh, biology department. Uh, it's, I have quite a strange background, actually. I uh, initially thought I was headed for a career uh, as a rock and roll star, as a youngster, I was in quite a successful band, uh, but unfortunately that didn't work out. Um, and then I pursued a career actually as an English teacher uh, for several years working around the world. But it was when my daughter was born in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, that really was the turning point. I'd spent many years at that point diving in different environments. And, and in particular in the Red Sea, I was very fortunate to dive with a lot of sharks. And it was at that time that really inspired my uh, passion for these large predators, these magical animals uh, that, you know, when you see them in the water, clearly a very capable uh, species. And so that led me back into education and has basically led me to the path uh, and, and the position I'm uh, now in. So I've been here in Canada for the past 10 years, and I've been working with WWF uh, probably now for about four or five years. And we've been working on a whole range of projects across the Arctic, uh, aside from Greenland sharks, a lot of work based on commercial fisheries with Greenland halibut. But staying focused here on the, on the Greenland shark, we've, we've been exploring some great scientific questions over the last few years, and very important ones for, for conservation and management, Doug. Those questions really revolve about post-release survival. Um, we've monitored, we've put biologgers on sharks to look at their uh, behavior following capture on long lines. This is related to community fisheries. We've surgically implanted, you can see here in the photo, uh, we've surgically implanted uh, tags into Greenland sharks that have a 10-year lifespan that allow us to understand long-term movements of these animals. So we have fixed receivers on the bottom right across the Arctic that are there listening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for if these animals pass within range. And it records a date and a timestamp of when the species is there. And we've, aside from that, we've also been exploring aspects of its metabolic ecology uh, to understand what the impact of Greenland sharks is within the uh, ecosystem. So really with, with the support of WWF, we've been exploring a whole range of key questions uh, related to uh, this particular species. 
But why? Why the Greenland shark? Well, maybe I'm personally a little bit biased by this particular species, but the Greenland shark is a very, very unusual animal. Firstly, it's the only true shark species that inhabits true Arctic uh, waters. It's a very large uh, species of shark. Basically, it's equivalent size to the great white shark. In fact, it reaches even larger sizes. And the other fact that it's got that's similar to the great white shark is the fact it's renowned for consuming uh, marine mammals. But this consumption of marine mammals in its diet is very intriguing for this particular species because, one, it is extremely slow swimming. In fact, it's been recorded as the slowest swimming animal on the planet. And therefore, given it swims at such slow speeds, it seems quite strange that this species is able to prey on very mobile and active species such as, as ring seal uh, and gnoll. This species is typically quite a, a deep water species. Uh, so it's not commonly uh, encountered by people, uh, you know, in coastal waters, but there are situations uh, where this does occur. But really, the Greenland shark is, uh, in many ways, quite a prehistoric uh, uh, looking animal. And given it's got such longevity, uh, these animals are so old, uh, up to 500 years uh, in age, really they're the grandpa of the uh, of the Arctic Ocean. And when we consider that sort of longevity, you know, we can consider that if we catch, say, a five meter animal Greenland shark now and tag that animal, potentially that animal was around in the 1600s swimming around in the ocean. That's quite something to think about, you know, what these species have witnessed in terms of how our oceans have changed since the advent of, of commercial fishing and in industrialization in uh, human uh, civilizations. So really the Greenland shark is uh, an extremely uh, unique species uh, in the Arctic, a very important species we think in terms of modulating uh, Arctic uh, ecosystems, but also a very enigmatic speaker, uh, species that really is you know, uh, a species that represents the Arctic environment. So, Nigel, you, you referred to the uh, to the Greenland shark as as the grandpa of, of of the Arctic Ocean, and you've told us a little bit about uh, you know about uh, you know how how grandpa lives. But can can you tell us a little bit about where uh, Greenland sharks live? You know, certainly yeah. the, the name gives gives a little bit of it away, but you know, certainly we can find them in Greenland. But where else can we find Greenland shark? Yeah, good question, Doug. So, it, yeah, so obviously it has the name Greenland shark, which actually the the Inuits in the Arctic find uh, quite annoying in Canada, uh, given that actually this shark has always been present in Canadian Arctic waters as, as well as in waters off Greenland. In terms of its distribution, uh, it's commonly encountered uh, across uh, the low, mid and high Arctic, uh, so from Northern Davis Strait right the way across uh, Baffin Bay, and we assume it's present in, in the Arctic Ocean, although no fishing has actually been conducted to try and catch this species there. Uh, that's where it's commonly encountered, and most people consider that's the range of the Greenland shark. But in fact, we do uh, catch Greenland sharks off Nova Scotia, they're quite commonly uh, caught in uh, bottom line uh, fishing and deep water fishing there, targeting uh, Atlantic halibut. And actually what we find is typically a size segregation. Uh, the animals that they catch off Nova Scotia are commonly the much larger animals, you know, the mature uh, adult uh, uh, members of the population. Um, whereas the animals that we commonly encounter, certainly in the Canadian Arctic side, uh, are probably around the two and a half to three and a half meter range. But saying that, what's unusual about the Greenland shark is we do have these deep water observations, uh, typically filmed from cameras or submersibles that are down. Uh, so I know of one record, for example, that was off a deep water rig in Cuba, I think around 2000 meters, 
uh, of uh, a somniosis. Uh, obviously, the Greenland shark is somniosis uh, microcephalus. But the, the issue we have is the sister species for the Greenland shark, the Pacific sleeper shark, uh, we cannot identify them apart visually. Uh, so we cannot uh, definitively say whether the, the individuals that are seen on these deep water cameras um, much further much further southern tropical latitudes, the somniosis microcephalus, uh, somniosis pacificus, or even somniosis antarcticus. So that remains a big question. But I suppose one fact I should add here is that when we go very deep in the ocean, the temperature becomes relatively uniform and is in fact very similar to the water temperatures that we encounter in the Arctic. So realistically, when we consider that Greenland sharks have a preference for a particular temperature range, that cold water temperature range, realistically, they could be circumglobal navigators. They could circumglobally navigate the entire ocean. So that's something that's a big question that we're asking, we want to ask, and hopefully one day we'll have an answer with regard to that. Right. So, so Nigel, you talk a lot about how, how these are deep water species. Uh, how deep are we are we talking about? And you know, if this is a, a deep water species, how do you locate these sharks and and tag these sharks um, as part of your research? Okay, so yes, they 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 they're labeled as a deep water species, and from satellite tag data, where we can generate time series depth data on these animals. What we typically find is their sort of preferred depth is between around 300 to 500 meters. And that vertical data typically shows them oscillating, uh, you know, in an oscillating pattern as they move along through the ocean. But often we see deep dives interspersed between that common oscillations where animals will dive down to at least a thousand meters. I think the deepest record uh, by satellite tags is approaching 2,000 meters, I think about 1,800 meters. And those deep dives can be quite common, uh, and we presume that they're, they're uh, locating prey that they've picked up by, uh, by SMAM. But saying that, uh, and, and when we capture Greenland sharks, we often can capture them on deep water long lines that we set around 900 meters depth. Uh, uh, typically in areas where uh, fishing for Greenland halibut takes place, which is a, you know, a, a, an obvious place where we can target this particular species. But we also encounter them in shallower waters. And this is a very unique aspect, again, of the Greenland shark. The, certainly in the Arctic in the summertime, if you're in areas where the Inuits uh, are conducting subsistent hunts for marine mammals, um, we can commonly encounter Greenland sharks in those uh, particular regions. And they can come so shallow, they'll literally you know, be in less than a meter of water uh, in the shoreline. And in those cases, they may come in to scavenge on a carcass, if there's a carcass of an animal uh, in the water. But more recently in some research that we've been conducting in the, in the Arctic, we've actually found that in one of the main narwhal summering grounds, uh, this is in Eclipse Sound, where there's several thousand narwhal uh, spend their summer there, that if we set long lines, we can set them in uh, between 50 and 100 meters of water. We can capture you know, numerous, uh, quite a high abundance of Greenland sharks in these areas, you know, suggesting some level of co-occurrence of Greenland sharks with narwhal, but also demonstrating that they're not just a deep water animal. You know, this species actually, you know, does enc encounter and does approach into these shallow water environments. Right. So now I've, I've heard it said that the Greenland shark is the internet's favorite shark uh, because there's, there's so many amazing facts about the Greenland shark. And one that, uh, that we tend to run across is that the Greenland shark is, is the oldest living vertebrate on the planet that you know, we, we've yet to find another vertebrate species that can live anywhere near as long as, as the Greenland shark. Is that true? Yes, so this was some fabulous work conducted uh, by Julius Nielsen uh, on aging the Greenland shark using 
Uh, a very interesting technique, if we've got a couple of minutes just to explain this. Uh, this technique was basically is it was based on what we call bomb radiocarbon. So uh, in the 1950s, 60s primarily, uh, there was large scale nuclear bomb tests in the oceans. And these basically left a, a signature, a, a bomb, an elevated bomb carbon signature. As many people will know, obviously bomb carbon decays at a known rate. And so using chronologies from reefs, we can calibrate that decay rate. And so using a calibration of that decay rate, uh, we can then measure bomb carbon in certain structures of animals. And then we can use that to actually assign a, quite a reliable age estimate for the animal. So the Nielsen et al. team, what they did was they actually used the eyeballs of Greenland sharks, the eye lenses, which grow incrementally, and they measured bomb carbon in those eye lenses to uh, provide the estimates that we have today, which, yeah, indicates the Greenland shark is a maximum estimate, uh, is just over 500 years old, um, wow. which, yes, does, does uh, record it as the longest lived species. But there is a point here as well we need to recognize that that is the maximum estimate. Uh, these sort of techniques do have quite large error margins in them. And so realistically, uh, you know, the, the maximum age estimate when we account for that error could range from, you know, around 250 to 500 uh, years old. So there's some variation there. But even 250 years old, that is a very old animal realistically. So, it, you know, I don't move quickly on on the best of days, but if I if I live to fought to be five hundred years old, um, I probably wouldn't be moving very quickly. Uh, do Greenland sharks move quickly, or are they a pretty slow uh, slow moving creature? Yeah, well, exactly as you say, Doug. And I must admit, I'd agree. I'm similar to you in many ways on this front. You know, with many animals. You, you sort of consider that when you have such longevity uh, in a species, that realistically to achieve that longevity, one approach to do that is really to slow life down. Uh, and so, you know, potentially you could slow your metabolic rate right the way down. Uh, and as a result of slowing your metabolic rate down, naturally you would obviously slow your movement rate uh, right down. And I think I, I said this in the introduction part, but yes, that's exactly what Greenland sharks do. Uh, the, the recorded swim speed for Greenland sharks is about 0.3 uh, meters per second, uh, which has been recorded basically as the slowest swim speed of, of fish that we know of. Uh, to date in the ocean. And, you know, when you see these animals underwater, for example, if you put baited underwater cameras down on the bottom of the ocean, uh, when we get these cameras back and we're in camp and we're watching the video, everyone's very excited. We see the shark come in in the distance. It's like, yay, we've got a Greenland shark. One's coming in on the camera. And then we're all still sat there 25 minutes later as the shark is still swimming in towards the camera. And so that sort of just demonstrates like this incredibly slow uh, movement of this particular species. But again, Greenland sharks, there's always ironies there. And what we can find is when the Greenland shark actually encounters the camera, we have like a bait in front of the camera, that as it starts to manipulate that bait, the Greenland shark will start to roll and turn. And its movements are actually quite exaggerated at that point. We actually see these sort of bursts uh, of activity. And we've, we've logged those also with biologger packages. So we, we put a biologger package on the Greenland shark, we release it, and that can measure like sort of X, Y, Z dimensional, three dimensional body movements of the Greenland shark, about 60 data points per second. And when we look at that again, we, we record these very slow movements, but then they're interspersed by these bursts, burst events where the Greenland shark clearly shows, no, I'm not just the slowest animal in the ocean. I can move if I want to. Great. So, Nigel, we've got some some folks who are engaged here on on Facebook, leaving some questions uh, for us, and uh, I might grab a, a couple of those now and uh, get your get your feedback on them. Yes, uh, this yeah. one, this one, I think, uh, inspired by the fact that I said I don't move very quickly. Um, Sarah's asking, you know, do Greenland sharks ever attack people? Do, do they ever attack humans? 
Okay. So obviously, uh, always a top question asked about any uh, shark species, understandably uh, so. Uh, with the Greenland shark, no. To date, there are no uh, documented uh, attacks of the, of the Greenland shark on people. And there's probably several reasons for that. Uh, one, they obviously typically occur in deeper water. Uh, so they're not commonly in environments where people are. When they do occur in shallow water, uh, as far as we know, that's only been documented by the Inuits in the Arctic. And so therefore we have low, very low population uh, numbers that are present, re like recreational water users. As you know, Doug, there's not many people swimming around in the Arctic or taking a recreational morning swim. Yep. Um, so, you know, the, the likely encounter rate is, uh, is very low. You know, saying that, obviously, the Greenland shark is a shark, you know, and it has, uh, although its teeth are very small, they're razor sharp, uh, multiple rows of teeth in the mouth. And so, you know, it's certainly very capable of, you know, removing large chunks of flesh. And, you know, possibly that there is the potential for an interaction, certainly with Inuit during subsistent hunts when they're stood in the water, that potentially a Greenland shark could interact with a human, but it would be purely mistaking the person for, you know, for scavenging on a carcass. Right. So note to self, look out for Greenland sharks if I'm standing in, in water in the Arctic. But yeah. uh, I, I try I try to do my best not to end up in the water. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we've got another question here from a different Sarah. Uh, she's heard that Greenland sharks can eat caribou and even polar bears. Is this true? Okay, so there's been documented reports. Uh, I know the caribou one, I think, perhaps is from over in Newfoundland area, uh, where a local guy uh, was fantastic and, and uh, rescued a Greenland shark that was actually in shallow waters with, a, I think, a caribou, a part of caribou stuck in its mouth. Wow. Uh, and I know that polar bear remains have been documented in uh, stomach contents. Uh, you know, I'm not going to rule out anything with the Greenland shark. You know, this animal continues to amaze me uh, and continues to sort of dismiss our predictions for it. Um, so everything is sort of possible. Realistically, I think, you know, the, the Greenland shark certainly feeds on big mammals, you know, ring seal uh, and marine mammals, including narwhal, uh, are common uh, in the stomach contents of these animals. And there's been a big ongoing debate about whether Greenland sharks actively predate on these animals or whether they only scavenge them. And there's mixed evidence there. We've seen Greenland sharks where the stomach's been uh, cut open and there'll be a whole ring seal in the stomach uh, and, but the seal will show signs of decay, i.e. it was scavenged. Uh, but equally, we've seen seals that are completely fresh, i.e. indicative that the Greenland shark actively predated. And as we touched on earlier, we're starting to build some strong evidence of, of interactions between uh, Greenland sharks and narwhal. So watch this space, you know, in the future, who knows? If, you know, we may be able to reveal that, you know, the Greenland shark is considered such a slow swimming animal is able to, in some way, uh, actively uh, predate on these larger mammal prey. Right. So a couple more questions here, and then we'll uh, we'll turn it over to our trivia section. So for all you watching uh, at home, we'll, we'll give you a chance to prove, uh, prove you've been paying attention. But uh, Alexander has asked a question here. Uh, when do Greenland shark have babies and how many? You know, knowing these are animals that could potentially live up to 500 years, uh, you know, when is the point where in that 500 years where they may start actually reproducing? So, Alexandra, you've asked the money question here. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, reproduction of Greenland sharks, we know extremely little at this point, certainly from... Uh, you know, what's been published in the literature. There may be some scientific investigation underway at present, but certainly what's documented for now. In fact, just to give you a scale uh, of like how amazing our lack of knowledge is of this species, is to date, we've really only got one or two uh, true documented records of pregnant females. That's it. Wow. So, you know, when you think of like the great white shark, where we actually have 
relatively few documented records. We're probably somewhere in the realms now of about 30 or so pregnant females. For the Greenland shark, we've realistically only got a couple of records. And in fact, the most reliable of those is from around, I'm approximate here, the late 1950s. So, you know, our ability to encounter large pregnant females for some reason has been very low. So to really answer your question, uh, yeah, this is a big, big, a big um, uh, missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, we have no idea, realistically, on the number of young. We know that they have live young. Uh, we don't truly know over the numbers. Uh, we don't truly know over the birth size. We really don't know where these large pregnant females go. Maybe they're the guys who are heading down to the Gulf of Mexico for a bit of sunshine uh, during the gestation. We have no idea, uh, you know, on those on that particular size class. But a great question. Right. So I think we'll we'll grab one more question here and then and then head over to our, our trivia section. Uh, but Aaron has asked, uh, bowhead whales, another Arctic marine species, are known to live a very long time, you know, up to two hundred years. Is there some kind of a relationship between um, you know these cold environment uh, preference species and these long lifespans? Yeah, no, it's, it, there's certainly a you know a correlation there. Uh, Doug and, and Aaron. Uh, yes, you're right. You know, we've got bowheads, uh, also um, Noel uh, and Beluga have all been shown to live over 100 uh, years old. Uh, the bowheads was a very unique study using dating the, um, the uh, harpoon heads, uh, you know, in a bowhead, which wow. allowed them to estimate the age of the animal. Uh, and they also used an approach with the eyeballs, uh, something called amino acid racemization. Um, but yes, it, it, there certainly is a case in the Arctic where we've got these, uh, these animals that live in this very cold uh, environment that do seem to have this level of longevity. But what we also have to remember is we also have a lot of species that are much faster growing, uh, such as like Arctic cod, which is, you know, one of the key fish species in the Arctic that links entire ecosystems. And that's, you know, a relatively short-lived and, and reasonably fast-growing species. So it doesn't stand true for all species. Great. So thanks, Nigel. Thanks for, for everybody uh, who asked questions here in the comments. If, if you've got more questions or more comments, uh, feel free to, uh, to throw them up in the comments, and we'll see if we, we might have some time to come back to those. Uh, after the end of our, our session here today, but uh, I think now we'll move on to our trivia section. All right, so as it says, uh, throw your, your answers to your questions here in the, uh, in the comment. This is going to be a test for us as well, though. Yeah. <laughs> so first question, how long can Greenland sharks go without food after eating a juvenile seal? Okay, so I suppose thinking here, Doug, you know, juvenile seal, uh, certainly a tasty Scooby snack. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of fat on the animal. Uh, and so that juvenile ring seal, a juvenile harp seal, juvenile bearded seal. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of, yeah, that's right. A lot of rich uh, fat on there. So very high uh, energy content in that particular uh, prey item. So yeah, you'd think it would, uh, it could survive quite a long time. Yeah. And just remember, folks uh, who are listening, throw your, your answers up in the comments. And the answer is more than 400 days off of one juvenile seal. Yeah, so that's some uh, recent work by graduate student Eric Stay Marie, who's been looking at the metabolic ecology of Greenland sharks. You know, these are obviously uh, uh, approximate estimates uh, based on metabolic rates. Um, but yeah, certainly incredible. So the, uh, the next question here, how long do Greenland sharks live? So well, you, may, you may have slow, mentioned this uh, earlier. <laughs> yeah, this very slow uh, uh, moving animal, as Doug said. So you th be careful here, think about it, you know, slowing down uh, your metabolic rate, slowing down your whole uh, way of life. Uh, certainly, uh, should lead to high longevity. Well, we got a couple answers here. 500 years, 400 years. 
Any other guesses in the last few seconds? 500 years again. And the answer, between 252 and 512 years. Yeah, fine. that amazing, incredible numbers, almost hard for us humans to comprehend. Yeah. Uh, again, obviously, as we chatted, Doug, those two, obviously, your estimates giving, you know, variability in that way of measuring age. Great. And the uh, next question here, what age can Greenland sharks start reproducing? So, again, I suppose this sort of counts, you know, naturally when you think about longevity. Uh, you know, the older animals are, then typically you'd expect them to uh, reproduce uh, at an older age as well. Yeah. Uh, so like when did the one shark hit that awkward teenage phase? That's the real question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see what that awkward teenage phase would uh, would resemble in terms of activity rates. So. <laughs> there's, there's an idea for a great study, Nash. Yeah, there you go. And the answer, 150 years. So this really highlights a very important point uh, in terms of uh, if you've got a species that can only start reproducing at 150 years old, then they're not able to sustain uh, high exploitation rates in fisheries. Probably they can't sustain it at all. Right. And uh, next up is how fast do Greenland sharks swim? Okay, so we, we touched on this, so people uh, listening, uh, I'm hoping they'll have a good guess. Uh, remember longevity, uh, slow life, living in the slow lane, uh, you know, taking 25 minutes to approach the, uh, the broth uh, when they're down on the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, I, I wouldn't think they need to get away from any predators, given they're the size of, of or bigger than a, a great white shark. That's right. A very few one predator killer whales. So go, go. Killer whales. Oh. And the answer, 0.3 meters per second. Yeah, incredibly uh, slow swim speed. But remember, everyone, they are capable of much faster movements as well. All right. And I think that actually is the last of our trivia questions yes it is because we're back on screen um so thanks everyone for for taking part in in the trivia there we're, we're not keeping score so we're all winners uh, <laughs> the, uh <laughs> yeah, i'm not good at tests yeah me neither the uh so thanks everyone for for taking the time to tune in here with us today uh learn a little bit about uh, about greenland sharks and thank thanks nige certainly for for taking the time with us today um if people want to learn more about what you and uh and your lab are doing is there a website they can they can take a look at yeah certainly well you know first again thank you very much doug and obviously wwf canada for having me uh, and obviously for supporting my work and and the graduate you know graduate students in uh, in my team uh, very very important uh and, and obviously thank you to all the viewers for, for tuning in and joining us uh, in this chat as well if you want to find out about some of the more of the work that we do, uh, you can visit our lab webpage. It's www.husseylab, H U W S E Y lab.com. Uh, and on there, you'll find some information uh, about the work that we're doing on, uh, on Greenland sharks and other species in the Arctic as well. Great. And we'll make sure to throw that, uh, that link up in the, the comments as well. So that kind of brings us to a close here today for, for Wildlife Wednesday. Uh, a future programming note I've been asked to share. Um, you know, we've been doing these Wildlife Wednesdays every Wednesday, uh, you know, once a week. Uh, moving forward, we'll be moving to once a month. So you can tune in and catch Wildlife Wednesdays on the last Wednesday of each month, uh, including two weeks from now, uh, the 29th of July, uh, will be our next session. And then the next one will be the last Wednesday in August. So. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you very much.